Welcome to our online audio library. My name is Mr. Bookman. If you enjoy audiobooks, make sure you press the like button, subscribe, and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our new uploads. I just looked up today's book on our audio card catalog, and it is now playing and ready on your device. So with that said, let's get right into the book. Grand Dame's Ghost Story by C.D. I don't know whether you ever tell your children ghost stories or not. Some mothers don't. But our mother, though of German descent, was strong-minded on the ghost subject, and early taught all her children to be fearless mentally as well as physically. And, though dearly fond of hearing ghost stories, especially if they were real true ghosts, we were sadly skeptical as to there being anything of the kind that could harm. We were quite learned in ghostly lore, knew all about doppelgangers, will-o'-the-wisp, blue lights, etc., and we could not have a greater treat for good behavior than for our mother to draw on her store of supernatural tales for our entertainment. The story I am about to relate she told us one stormy night, when gathered round her chair in her cosy sanctum, before a cheerful fire, we ate nuts and apples, and listened while she recited an or true tale told her by her grandmother, who herself witnessed the vision. It was a fearful night. The wind sobbed and wailed round the house like lost spirits mourning their doom. The rain beat upon the casements, and the trees, writhing in torture of the fierce blast, groaned and swayed till their tops almost swept the earth. Bright flashes of lightning pierced even the most closed shutters and heavy curtains, and the thunder had a sullen, threatening roar that made your blood creep. It was a night to make one seek to shut out all sound, draw the curtains close, stir the fire, and nestle deep in the armchair before it, with feet upon the fender, and have something cheerful to think or talk about. But I was all alone, none in the house with me but servants, and the servant's wing was detached from the main part of the building, for I do not care to have menials near me, and I had no loved ones near. It was just such a night that Nancy Black died. What a fearful night for the soul to leave its earthly home and go out into the vast, unknown future! I spoke aloud, as rousing from a train of thought. I drew my heavy mantle closer round me, wheeled my armchair nearer the fire, and cuddled down in it, burying my feet in the foot-cushion to warm them, for I felt strangely cold. I was in the library. It was my usual sitting-room, for I seldom used the parlors. What was the use? My books were my friends, and I loved best to be with them. My children dead or married and away. The cold, grand parlors always seemed gloomy and sad. The ghosts of the departed pleasures haunted them, and I cared not to enter them. It was a long, wide room across the hall from the parlors, running the whole length of the house, and was lined with shelves from floor to ceiling. My husband's father had been a bibliomaniac, and my husband had had a leaning that way also, and the shelves held so many an old rare work that was worth its weight in gold. The fire, though burning brightly, did not illume half the room of which, sitting in the chimney corner, I commanded a full view, and had been looking at the shadows playing on the furniture and shelves as the flame shot up, and after flickering a moment would die out leaving a gloom which would break away into fantastic shadows as the firelight would shoot up again. While watching the gleams of light and darkling shades, unconsciously the wailing of the storm outside attracted my attention. There seemed to be odd noises of tapping on the windows and sobs and sighs, as though someone was entreating entrance from the fierce tumult. And as I sat there, again I thought of Nancy Black, the old school girlfriend who had loved me so dearly, and the night when she went forth to meet the doom appointed her. Resting my head upon my hand, I sat gazing in the fire, thinking over her strange life, and still stranger death, and wondering what could have become of the money and jewels that I knew she had once possessed. While sitting thus, a queer sensation crept over me, it was not fear, but a feeling as though if I'd looked up I'd see something frightful. A shiver, not like that of cold, ran from my head to my feet, 
and a sensation as though someone was breathing ice-cold breath upon my forehead, the same feeling you would cause by holding a piece of ice to your cheek. It fluttered over my face and finally settled round my lips, as though the unseen one was caressing me, thrilling me with horror. But I am not fearful, nervous, nor imaginative, and resolutely throwing off the dread that fell upon me, I turned round and looked up, and there, so close by my side that my hand, involuntarily thrown out, passed through her seeming form, stood Nancy Black. It was Nancy Black, and yet not Nancy Black. Her whole body had a semi-transparent appearance, just as your hand looks when you hold it between yourself and a strong light. Her clothing, apparently the same as worn in life, had a wavy, seething, flickering look, like flames have, and yet did not seem to burn. "'In the name of God, Nancy Black, what brought you here, and whence came you?' I exclaimed. A hollow whisper followed. "'Thank you, my old friend, for speaking to me, and oh, how deeply I thank you for thinking of me tonight. I shall have rest.' "'Rest,' I heard echoed, and a jeering laugh rang through the room that made her quiver at its sound. I have been near you often, but always failed to find you in a condition when you would be in rapport before to-night. What I came for I will tell you. Whence I come, you need not know. Suffice it to say, that were I happy, I would not be here on such an errand, nor on such a night. It is only when the elements are in tumult, and the winds wail and mourn, that we come forth. When you hear these sounds, it is souls of the lost you hear mourning their doom. "'Tis then they wander up and down, to and fro, "'their only release from their fearful home "'of torture and undying pain. "'I have come to tell you that you must go over to the old house, "'and in the back room I always kept locked, "'have the carpet taken up from toward the fireplace. "'You will see a plank with a knot-hole in it. "'Remove that, and you will find what caused me to lose my soul. "'Have prayer said for me, for tis well to pray for the dead.' THE MONEY AND JEWELS GIVE IN CHARITY. BURY IN HOLY GROUND THE OTHERS YOU FIND, AND PRAY FOR THEM AND ME. AH, JEANETTE, YOU THOUGHT YOUR OLD FRIEND, THOUGH STRANGE AND ODD, PURE AND INNOCENT. IT IS A BITTER PART OF MY PUNISHMENT THAT I MUST CHANGE YOUR THOUGHT OF ME. FAREWELL, DO NOT FAIL ME, AND I SHALL TROUBLE YOU NO MORE. BUT WHENEVER YOU HEAR THAT WIND HOWL AND SWEEP ROUND THE HOUSE AS IT DOES TONIGHT, KNOW THAT THE LOST ARE NEAR. It is their swift flight through space, fleeing before the scourge of memory and conscience that causes that sound. That tomorrow you may not think you are dreaming, here is a token. And she touched the palm of my hand with her fingertips. And as you see, my child, to this day, there are three crimson spots on the palm of my hand that nothing will eradicate. Do not fail me, and pray for us. Jeanette, pray. And with a longing, wistful gaze, and a deep, sobbing sigh, Nancy Black faded from my sight. "'Am I dreaming?' I exclaimed, as I rose from my chair and rang the bell. When the servant entered, I bade him attend to the fire and light the lamps, and I went through the room to see if any unusual arrangement of furniture could have caused the appearance, but nothing was apparent.' and I bade him send my maid to attend me in my chamber, for I could not help feeling unwilling to remain in the library any longer that evening. While making my toilet for the night, my maid said, "'Have you burned your hand, madam?' Glancing hastily down, I saw three dark crimson spots upon the palm of my left hand. They had an odd look, seared as though touched by a red-hot iron. Yet the flesh was soft, not burned, and not painful." Making some excuse for it, I did not allude to it again, and dismissed her speedily, that I might reflect undisturbed over the singular occurrence. There were marks upon my hand, I could not remove them, and they did not fade. In fact, their deep red made the rest of the palm lose its pinkish hue and look pale from the strong contrast. Could I have been asleep and dreamed it all, and by any means have done this to myself? I thought, but finally concluded that on the morrow I'd go over to Nancy Black's old residence and settle the question, 
and with that conclusion had to content myself until the morrow came. Nancy Black was an old friend from my girlhood, who had owned a large property in the town, and lived all alone in a spacious stone house directly opposite my home, and who, when dying, had left me the sole legatee of her property. When morning came I took the keys, and with my maid went over to Nancy's house, it had never been disturbed since her death, which was sudden and somewhat singular, and the furniture remained just as she left it when taken to her last resting place. We went into the room Nancy had directed. I bade Sarah take up the carpet, and sure enough, there was a plank with a knot-hole in it. So I sent her from the room, and lifted the plank myself, and there, between the two joints, rested a long box the lid not fastened. Opening it, I was horrified to see two skeletons, those of an infant and of a woman, small in stature and delicate frame. In a moment it flashed before me that I saw all that remained of Nancy Black's younger sister, a girl of seventeen, who had left home somewhat mysteriously years ago, and had died while absent. At least that was the version Nancy had given of her absence and no one had dreamed of doubting it her tale was so naturally told left orphan when lucy was only two years and nancy eighteen she had devoted her life to the care of this young girl and when she found her sister had fallen she in her pride of name and position had destroyed mother and child that her shame might not be known and had lived all those dreary years in that house with her fearful secret Round the box, heaped up on every side, were money and jewels, and a parchment scroll among them had written on it, Lucy's share of our father's estate. I carried out Nancy's wishes to the letter, for now I firmly believed that she had come to me herself that night. To avoid scandal resting on the dead, I took our clergyman into my confidence, and with his assistance had the remains buried quietly in consecrated ground. The money and jewels were given to the poor, and the old building I turned into a home for destitute females. And morning and night, as I kneel in prayer, I pray forgiveness to rest upon Nancy Black and peace to her troubled soul. End of Story 11